Greetings, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the, this AMC webinar on provenance research. Uh, my name is David Saunders. I'm an associate curator here at the uh, Getty Museum in, in Los Angeles. Uh, and it's my pleasure to as I welcome you to today's event and, and to, uh, to host proceedings. Um, we have a huge amount to get through today and uh, I want to limit uh, my remarks um, very, very briefly. Um, nominally as co-organizer, though I do have a, a few, if only thanks, to, to offer. Um, just to say that say this, this webinar program began maybe 18 months or so ago um, with a fairly casual conversation with Judith Pinero at the AMC. Um, for the last few years, one of the hats that I've been wearing here at the museum is overseeing our Antiquities Department's provenance research project with my colleagues Nicole Budrovich and Judith Barr. Um, and as we've been working, particularly being here at the Getty, very aware that um, the World War II era studies and um, focus on paintings, there is a lot of material uh, available, particularly uh, we've seen with our colleagues at the Getty Research Institute, the Provenance Index and the uh, Project for the, study and for the Study of Collecting and Provenance, um, really seeing there is an enormous amount of energy and activity and resources that are out there and wondering kind of how that can be sort of brought to bear on uh, other fields in which this research is only just beginning or is, is rather more inchoate. Um, and it was really through a sort of informal conversation with Judith uh, Pinero that this uh, sort of seed was planted. And I'm incredibly grateful to her for, for bringing this to fruition. Um, and she and her colleagues, Lucy Leiden, Hannah Kursky, and Monica Valenzuela have really done an enormous amount to uh, to make this possible, and uh, I say I'm delighted to welcome you all, you all uh, today. Um, what was really special as well is that the AMC have done a number of webinars in the past, individual focused projects, but Judith recognized that this was a, a theme that was very broad and very deep and that merited a series of sessions. And so uh, I hope that all of you watching have had the chance to see uh, the previous two uh, webinars. They've each be con been conceived as separate components, but at the same time building on, uh, on each other. Uh, if you haven't had the chance, or if you would like to watch again, uh, the previous webinars and this one, uh, once it's complete, will be uh, available uh, to access via the AMC's uh, website, uh, both for members and non-members alike. Uh, the first 12 months, um, there is a, a small fee, and then uh, in a year's time, uh, all of the, the webinars will be accessible for free. Um, as those of you who have seen the last two webinars will, will testify, we've been able to bring together uh, an incredible uh, selection of panelists and speakers, uh, really drawing on, on a very deep expertise and experience. And I'm uh, hugely grateful to everyone who has is, who is, um, committed and, and, and participated in these sessions. Uh, and if I can single out anyone, the, the moderators for the previous two sessions, Jane Meloche and Mackenzie Mallon, uh, did an enormous amount of work to shape uh, and direct those two those two sessions. So thank you to them. Um, it was evident to me that an hour and fifteen minutes was not enough for, for either of those. Um, but for today's session, we're going to turn our eyes somewhat to to the future. And if the first two webinars looked at how we do provenance research, this one I think looks at what we can do with it once you know with with the research being done. And amongst the themes and topics that we sketched out, I think particularly even in the small time that I've been doing this, or sort of involved with this sort of work, seeing just how much is developed digitally and online and thinking about the ways in which um, new research, new methods of researching uh, are being facilitated and um, empowered uh, as more and more resources are digitized, as more and more museum collections put their information online. Um, as linked open data provides potential models to work with this material and really energize and facilitate this work. And that's something that we will be, we will be addressing this more, this, today. Um, parallel with that is thinking quite broadly, I think, as to how we can embed provenance research more deeply, more effectively into museum practice, into art historical studies, and thinking about the methods that are effective for disseminating this research uh, be it online, in the galleries, in the classroom. And as we collectively uh, talked about these themes, I think the sort of the, the watchword was sharing. So be it sharing 
information with colleagues, sharing it with students, sharing it uh, in the galleries or, or, or online or with our, with our public at large. So those are some of the sort of broad themes and outlines for, for today's session. And I'm thrilled uh, to be joined by our four panelists um, and collectively they bring uh, a really deep set of insights, experience, and I think ideas for, for thinking about this material. And I say I'm delighted uh, to welcome them today. Uh, in the interest of time, um, you will find their full bios on uh, the website for, the, for, the, for, the, for, the, for this session. Um, but just briefly, and just to check that our audio is working, uh, I'll introduce um, uh, my, my local colleague, David Newbury, at the uh, Getty Trust, uh, the Enterprise Software Architect. Um, and many of you may know David from his previous role at uh, the Carnegie uh, Museum of the Art Tracks project. Um, moving yes, eastwards, uh, Nancy Carrolls uh, from the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. Uh, Nancy is the curator of uh, provenance of forensic history at the Cranach uh, Museum of Art, uh, which he will be uh, talking to us about today. Uh, on the East Coast, um, Jody, Professor Jody Cranston uh, at the uh, Boston, Boston University, Professor of um, History of Art and Architecture and um, creator of the Mapping Titian and Mapping Paintings projects. And last but by no means least, since it is much later in the evening, uh, over in Germany, Christine Howold uh, from the Technisches Universität in Berlin, uh, where she coordinates the Art Market and Provenance Research Project, as well as being uh, an assist associate researcher at the uh, Berlin Museum for Asiatische Kunst. So welcome to all four of you and publicly thank you for all of the work that you've done in preparing for, for today's session. Um, finally, I'd like to welcome all of you uh, out there who are watching. I'm delighted to know that there are so many of you. Um, and I really hope that this provides um, a chance for a discussion, for thinking, and you know, we have brought together virtually some great minds and I would really encourage you to um, make the most of them in the, in the next hour or so. Uh, you will see, if I point downwards, there is a Q&A button, uh, and I would encourage you to submit your questions through that uh, at any point during proceedings. Um, we will then be able to harvest those and pass them along to our, to our speakers. Uh, in contrast to the previous sessions, today's session is gonna be um, a series of presentations. I've asked each of the participants uh, one by one to give a short presentation around 10 minutes apiece um, and my hope is that between those there will be time for specific questions uh, and then a, a more sustained conversation towards the close. So whenever inspiration strikes you please uh, submit your questions and we will be able to pass them uh, along to our speakers. With that uh, I uh, I say I'm delighted to get this started and I think I will hand over the microphone as it were to to Nancy. Um, Nancy please. Thank you very much David. Um, so this morning I'd like to speak about an exhibition that I curated this past year at the Krenner Art Museum at the University of Illinois. I'm a PhD student there and while I was working on the dissertation I um, also did a uh, part-time two-year provenance research project, uh, and I should specify a World War II era provenance research project on the uh, foundational collection of European art at the museum, um, all paintings. And uh, this exhibition actually sprang out of that project. Uh, I gave a couple of public talks uh, to members of the museum and to the university community. And what I realized, along with the curator of European art that I was working with, is that People were not just interested in the results of provenance and the stakes of provenance, although that was certainly um, something that people shared an interest in. They also had enthusiasm for the methods of provenance research, how we do our work, sort of the nitty gritty ins and outs. And so that was the seed for uh, this exhibition. So it's provenance, a forensic history of art. It opened in May of 2017. It was to run one year and it has been extended um, by one year due to um, enthusiasm for the exhibition. Uh, so the objectives of the exhibition that I had going into it was first to demonstrate some of the methodologies of provenance research. Uh, that includes genealogy and physical examinations like look at stamps and labels on the backs of paintings. Uh, people don't really get to see the back of the very often and so I really wanted to look at that. 
Um, I also wanted to highlight some of the challenges that provenance researchers encounter in our research. For example, how to research an object um, that has multiples or copies when the provenances historically have been all mixed up. Um, questions like, what does a red flag mean, uh, name mean? What do you do when you encounter a red flag name in an object's provenance? And overall, my goal was to show that provenance research is really nuanced and complex. And that is really the reason that it takes so long and costs so much money. Emphasize museum visitors um, to some of the challenges we encounter and to, to normalize the idea that an incomplete provenance or between 1933 and 1945 for an object in many museums is actually the norm, um, not, uh, not the exception. An incomplete provenance is the norm, not the exception. Um, and finally, I wanted to share that provenance is an ongoing project. Museums didn't just do a couple of years of research and then move on. When we have these unresolved, incomplete provenances during those years, we keep working at it, keep chip chipping away as uh, new resources become available. Um, so I'm going to show you just a, few, a couple of uh, very quick uh, visuals from the exhibition so you have a sense of what it looked like. So here we are. And so the first slide here, um, this is the gallery uh, in which the Provenance exhibition took place at Craner Art Museum. It was a small exhibition, just uh, six paintings, one of which, as you see in the middle there, was shown uh, the back and the front. Um, and it created, I think, a very intimate atmosphere to get to know these objects and their histories. So I actually appreciated that small gallery space that we had. Um, the second slide here shows um, one of the um, uh, visuals that we had for uh, for one of the exhibition, uh, one of the exhibits. So this was uh, an exhibit that talked about genealogy and how we do genealogical research, much like families who are tracing their family trees in order to identify um, previous owners. For this one, for example, in the written provenance, the recorded provenance we had for this painting by the master of the St. Ursula legend, we believed it had been owned by four different women, but a quick genealogical search found that it was the same woman who'd owned the painting, but she'd had four different names in the course of her life, from her maiden name, two married names, and her final divorced name that um, was from her last married name, combined with her uh, maiden name. Um, and so we had these little visuals for several of the exhibits that um, helped to explain the story in a non-textual or a less textual way than just one panel of text. Um, this is from an exhibit. Uh, we have a copy of a Romney portrait, and we also had the original drawing that uh, went with the original painting that is currently in the National Gallery of Scotland. So for this one, we talk about attribution um, and what to do when there are uh, multiples of, a, of an object uh, whose provenance we need to trace. And for this last slide, um, uh, I discussed documentary information. Um, what kinds of resources do we look at? So here are a couple of uh, historical exhibition catalogs from the 19th century. I was able to find a photograph of this painting in situ in an Irish castle from 1913 that helped uh, the provided a very crucial link to its provenance. And um, people were very drawn to the visual aspects of the exhibition. And I'm not talking about the paintings, I'm talking about the graphics that we used in the interpretation. So that was an interesting finding. So that was just a quick overview of some of the exhibits in the painting. Okay. Um, we had a whole, um, programming set up for the exhibition. Uh, the university was really, really helpful in helping your funding, um, as well as panelists to come. We had um, three visiting lectures. We had a gallery talk in which we had the curator from the Eskenazi Museum of Art at Indiana University, Jenny McComas, come in and do a comparative um, dialogue with one of our rare law books curators at the University of Illinois, who is uh, an expert in stolen books. So we were talking about how do you research stolen books compared to how do you research stolen art. And that was very well attended and really interesting. Uh, we had Mackenzie Mellon, who was the moderator for last week's panel on provenance, come in and give an excellent talk on uh, the monuments men. And finally, we had a lawyer who specializes in indigenous restitutions come in and compare legal frameworks for um, World War II era restitutions, 
and Native American institutions under NAGPRA. Um, we also uh, have an amazing uh, education team at Craner Art Museum that devised an activity for middle and high school students in which uh, they actually manufactured, manufactured artificial provenance documents, some of which were conflicting in order for students to help build a provenance trail while encountering some of the very challenges that provenance researchers encounter. Uh, I've been told that this was a very popular activity with students. I've looked at the materials and I would love to do this activity myself. It was pretty fabulous. Um, really amazing the kinds of things that you can do um, with provenance in terms of interpretation, in terms of education, reaching your visitors. Um, you just have to be creative about it. Um, and finally, a lot of professors used uh, this exhibition in their own courses. For example, we have um, an African art professor who is using the small provenance exhibition, which is at the entry of the museum, to um, sensitize her students to the idea of exchanges of art through time before bringing them into um, an African art exhibition that was going on at the time. Um, this was an introductory class for students who hadn't really encountered or engaged much with African art. And so using European art in which they had a stronger background to familiarize them with concepts of ownership, she found was really, really helpful. Um, so the reception of the exhibition appears to have been quite um, positive. We don't have a formal evaluation for it, unfortunately. So it's, um, my notion of its success is just from comments, from emails and letters, um, as well as interviews with uh, museum staff, with docents, and with guards. Um, just to repeat what I said, um, that docents have found really interesting ways to engage children with uh, Provenance research, even some going as, as low as the fourth grade. Um, that was a really interesting finding for me, that you can introduce some of the ideas from World War II era provenance to even younger kids. Um, and the fact that even though these were textually quite heavy in the interpretation, um, visitors were drawn to each exhibit by the visuals that accompanied the text, then they turned over to the text, and then they looked at the painting and looked at the exhibit as a whole. Um, so it seems to have been quite eye-opening for visitors. Um, they had been intrigued in the theory of provenance and the stories behind it, but they didn't quite know how we went about the work, uh, and they were curious about it. So this satisfied some of their curiosity, hopefully creating some, um, some, some deeper interest in it that many provenance researchers hope will lead to more funding. Um, and it brought home something that they hear about and they see in movies, but they didn't really know a whole lot about. Um, I was happy that this exhibit took place, this exhibition took place because there aren't that many exhibitions about provenance in North America. It's becoming more common in Europe. Uh, Germany is doing a fantastic job with these kinds of exhibitions. Um, but this uh, indicates to me that there is an interest in it, a demand for it from our visitors, and that this is something we should be thinking about, just like conservation is an area that we would never talk about in the galleries maybe 50 years ago. But now some curators uh, in tandem with their conservation people are um, putting on exhibitions about conservation or that have some conservation aspect to them. And visitors are flocking to them. There's a real interest in that. So uh, I'm, I'm happy to see that you know, provenance is somewhere along those lines. Um, and I think the key is just to be creative about how you interpret provenance. Um, I happen to focus on methodologies, but certainly we can focus on on results, we can focus on different tools. Um, just yeah, being creative about how we use it, I think, is really key. Um, I think that being transparent about the challenges that we face in provenance research actually helps to reach our uh, visitors. Um, just admire, uh, admitting that we we are facing um, these challenges with funding, with resources, helps to make that connection with them. I think they get a better sense of what we're trying to work through. And again, hopefully that translates to extra funding in the future. And speaking of funding, um, I think that using the research that we've already done, that we've already paid for, is a great way to maximize returns on that research, on the investment in that research. So that's one way to potentially also pitch provenance exhibitions to um, museum leadership. Uh, and in fact, it's true. 
Um, so yeah, that was my little spiel about the exhibition. I encourage anyone who happens to be in the Midwest to please come to Cranor Art Museum in Champaign, Urbana and uh, visit the exhibition. Now, I don't know if I'm taking questions now, David, or- There is time, yes. We have, uh, we have a couple of minutes for questions. So I would, again, encourage those watching um, to, to write in. I'm, I will, one thought occurred to me, given, given our audience, potentially of curators, and I just was interested if you could say a little bit more about how you selected objects for the exhibition, particularly you started out by saying incomplete evidence is often the norm and this research is ongoing. Um, did you encounter wariness on the part of the curatorial staff or the museum staff in, uh, in, in some of the objects you wanted to talk about and how did you navigate that? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, I specifically chose objects, um, a selection of objects for which I had a complete provenance during the World War II era and for which I did not have a complete provenance during the World War II era because that is the actual situation in the museum. I've been able to trace some of the provenances in full, some of them not, and I really, really wanted to convey that. Um, on the labels, for which, uh, for the objects for which I didn't have a complete provenance, I made sure to say, this is a work in progress. The museum continues to do their research on this. The museum was really amazing. I think they understood what we were trying to accomplish with this exhibition. They were on board from the beginning. Uh, my, um, my own interactions with other curators at other museums have indicated that not all museums would be on board with this um, kind of an approach. Uh, perhaps it's because Cranert is at the University of Illinois, we're a public institution institution at a public university and perhaps there's more of a emphasis on pedagogy I'm not quite sure but the museum was very welcoming and very forward-thinking with this exhibition. Yes. A, couple, a couple of questions that are, that are coming in one sort of feeding off on that do you think your your education colleagues would be willing to share some of the information on the on the program that you mentioned is that something that we could disseminate? I think so. I think they've gotten a lot of requests for it because it is really amazing. Um, and I think if you um, want to get in touch with me after this webinar, I'd be happy to share their contact information with anyone who's interested. Uh, one other question. Um, other plans? Are for, I mean, you said this exhibition has been extended already a year and your discussion as well of bringing uh, groups in to talk about so African materials it indicates that it's clearly playing a kind of really valuable role within the museum itself. Is there, is there is there a plan to develop any of this material for the show into the permanent collection or online? So we have started uh, gradually rolling out some of the um, exhibition labels on the website so that at least uh, even if people can't get the, um, the whole experience of the exhibition, they can read um, some of our interpretations. Um, and I believe that there will be some additional labeling in the galleries um, once we put the paintings back on permanent display, um, indicating some interesting things about the provenance. And uh, again, this, the curators at this museum are so forward looking. I think that in the future, they will be looking to um, consider uh, provenance as something that they would put on labels. And I'm not talking about the provenance narratives, which are more or less interesting to most people, not everyone wants to see that on a label, but in interpreting an object to include the ownership history as part of the interpretation as um, one aspect that isn't often covered, instead of um, you know, the, the traditional um, maker and object information that you would find on that label. Thank you. I think I maybe can squeeze and squeeze in one last question. Um, that sort of speaks maybe to a, a, something we've touched on a little bit, but beginning with problematic provenances, um, were any of the donors of the works that you were display on display put on display still alive? Was that sort of an issue in sort of working with um, donors to the museum and others who have a, have a, a, a vested interest in the, in the objects themselves? That's a very important question, uh, and I think that will vary from museum to museum as to how uh, donors uh, take this. Um, so this was the foundational collection uh, donated by the Trees family in Chicago. Um, we are now um, working closely with their descendants uh, on provenance issues, so it was almost all from the same family. Um, my understanding is that they were on board. Um, we also 
didn't have any controversial provenances uh, involved. Uh, we had some incomplete ones, but nothing that would, um, you know, kind of raise a red flag in anyone's mind. And I think that may have helped to clear things with, um, with on the donor side. Excellent. That's something to consider for sure. Thank you, Nancy. And in the interest of time, um, why don't we move move along in a related vein? I think um, in terms of presenting provenance and sharing it more broadly, um, Jody, would you like to talk a little bit about your mapping petition and mapping paintings projects? I'm coming to provenance a little bit as an outsider, just to kind of confess this <laughs> from the beginning that. Um, I am a professor of art history, and I have to confess that before I was at work on an individual project relating to artworks that were seen by various artists in the past, I hadn't given much attention to provenance, um, but became very interested in it in part, and I'll turn over to some slides that I've prepared, um, in part because of um, museum labels. Uh, such as the one that you can see um, here. Let me just start my slideshow. Um, which is a pretty overwhelming list of um, where a particular artwork from the National Gallery traveled, and one that I think is difficult even for our historians to wade through. But within it, I realized there were these fascinating stories, which I know are very familiar to those of you who work more extensively on provenance, but it felt to me like this was inaccessible to students who were really interested in collecting and collections, and that there had to be a way of making this information more readily available, kind of in the way that Nancy was talking about. One of the things that really struck me was the reverses of these pictures, which is Nancy also mentioned most of us um, who are not curators will ever really see. And behind these paintings, um, to me, was just the perfect way of visualizing information in a way other than a list form. It had provided a perfect kind of diagram for where these objects had been over time. And as a result of that, I decided that it might be worthwhile to play around with what could happen if this information was visualized in a different way from a list. Um, and so that led me to create first my mapping titian project and then develop um, my mapping paintings project. The mapping paintings project is the more recent one. It actually is built very similarly to the mapping titian project, both of which were generously funded by the press and was a great opportunity for me to think about ways to visualize this information, but also think creatively about what was possible within digital art history projects. One of my goals in doing this project was not to make a website that was useful only to me, um, but was able to be used by other scholars. Um, now, not a lot of people are interested in Titian provenance, um, which led me then to create mapping paintings which is a much more open source um, and kind of intellectual crowdsource site where any user could come and contribute their own data to this particular um, platform. Now, in terms of how exactly these were put together, um, most of you are familiar with working with spreadsheet, but one of the things that became really clear to me is that the provenance data is perfect for working on these kinds of digital history projects because as well as longitude and latitude points, which you can see within the spreadsheet locations, owners, it also is very clear in showing places where this information isn't necessarily always known with certainty, which is one of the biggest obstacles to creating these kinds of platforms that involve Provenance data. Um, art historians, curators, we all kind of accept and embrace. Successful. 
recently. Um, but what we developed was in Mapping Kitchen, a way of showing where artworks traveled over the course of their lifetime um, with both static maps as well as animated timeline maps. And it really helped me to see that there were some kinds of questions that could be raised in understanding where these objects had been, including something like Kitchen's Diana and Action, which is a well-known picture and really focusing on where it had been and why. Um, and sometimes we find these paintings are way out in the hinterlands of these different um, countries and thinking about who saw them and how they were influential um, is I think an important part of or result of these mapping projects. Another thing that became clear, um, this is a view from the Mapping Paintings platform, is how uh, meaningful it is to show when objects are actually lost or destroyed. And so here I'm showing an example where this was an object that was destroyed in World War II. Um, this becomes a very powerful teaching tool for my students. Um, when the pin stops, it's really quite, um, I think, vivid for the students who otherwise just think of some of these historical events in a very remote way. Um, and I'm I certainly would extend that to museum visitors as well. Um, in terms of what can be captured within the platform itself, if anyone were to contribute um, provenance data to the platform, I'm gonna show you a split screenshot because I couldn't show all of it in one view. Um, this being an example for an artwork that's the Worcester Art Museum. I'm currently working with the Worcester Art Museum to install some tablets um, as part of a kind of demonstration of how those artworks arrive from various locations to the museum itself. Um, this allows us to capture basic information as well as a list of itineraries and owners. And one of the things that becomes fairly clear fairly quickly is how we try to accommodate issues of things being unknown, locations being unknown, owners being unknown, and giving users the opportunity to comment on why that might have happened. Um, so um, we have within the map views um, places where there can be place, um, areas of scholarly debate, citations of sources, all things that become important depending on what users are interested in. It will be fascinating, I think, um, I hope to um, see the ways in which the Worcester Art Museum is able to use these tablets. It's a smaller museum for those of you who aren't familiar with it, and they have to work hard to get viewers or visitors into the museum, and this might be a way to really make the history of Worcester much more vivid for those, those visitors. Um, and then I just um, have on this slide just a series of questions um, in terms of the possibilities and limitations of dig digital reach Sources for provenance. I, of course, am again a bit of an outsider to the curatorial world, and one of the things I've encountered in working on these projects is not only how much I didn't know, I'm very humble about that, um, but also thinking about ways in which academic art historians and, and curatorial art historians can work more profitably and productively um, to share expertise and also resources so we're all not reinventing the wheel. Um, and so some of these questions I think are important for really deciding if um, this is a possibility to show provenance in some kind of digital art history project. Clearly there are issues involved in that as Nancy was alluding to at her presentation, um, but also thinking about the ways in which institutions can more effectively share these resources that we're all developing on our own, um, or if that's, if there are just some inherent limitations to that. Um, so that's essentially my perspective on, on the field and my projects. I'm just going to leave it all turn it back to you. Thank you, Jody. Um, I know we had, uh, I think, a, a, a few little problems with people hearing. I think the, the audio might have gone in and out. So um, you were talking, Jody, about the, the Worcester project. Roughly how many paintings, are, or I presume it's paintings, are you going to be focusing on in that project? Um, there are about 10 within the, within the Worcester Museum. And selected? 
and selected i'm sorry selected for uh, to show different stories i mean what are the, the criteria for selecting those paintings essentially just based on what the museum itself wanted to display. They all happened to be in the same room um, and they all came through one collector in Worcester before they came to the museum, um, which also I think is important because these objects were housed just up the street at the Worcester Art Museum and now it's a boys and girls club, but um, visitors to the museum could then just walk up the street and see that this was a place that has historic significance. Excellent. So again, the, we have a, a little bit of time for questions. Um, one question we have, it's, you know, it's interesting, I think you, know, you touched upon this as well. Do you find that foundations, experts, specialists, museums are proprietary or protective of their information or how have you negotiated that sharing of information? I, I would say Everything that you listed has been a characteristic of my, my one or more of my experiences. Um, I think that there's some reluctance to wanting to present that information. I understand there's you know, political situations and or politics involved in, in that. Um, I also think that there is a kind of proprietariness in terms of even just how that information is shown and I think museums are under a lot of pressure to have a digital component to what they're presenting to, to museum um, visitors. And um, oftentimes I think you know, a particular group might have been charged with uh, working on a digital project and maybe doesn't want to um, expand their scope to rely on, um, on work that's being done by others. Uh, I think Jody may have frozen. Um, and so um, the things that might be of interest to me not, might not be of interest to, to, you know, the institutional objectives that are being put forward, which I completely understand. One, we have a, a very I guess, specific practical question from, uh, from those using um, your, your, your mapping painting project. Um, and the use of latitude and longitude coordinates and what happens if you don't have the specific locations, if you only have, you know, a city, for example. Right. So um, in the case of only having a city, we choose a kind of a generic spot that's in the center of the city, um, which just kind of stands in for whatever that specific location might be, if it's completely unknown. Um, we just mark that it's unknown, but at this moment, we don't have anything that graphically indicates that, um, that there's no known location. Um, in future phases, our hope is that we'll be able to have something that indicates to, um, to users that it's an unknown spot, whether that's a flashing pin or some other kind of um, indicator. But for now, it's just a kind of indication on the timeline that says from X date to Y date or even unknown date to unknown date, we aren't sure exactly where this is. I would, that would I would, be the best compromise we could come up with. Yeah, no, I was, I was thinking kind of what you do with information that isn't certain or reportedly and how you could, I mean, could there be a, a sort of a, in the future a way of color coding that or so? Other, other. Absolutely. Yeah, there are plays of color coding it. I'm sure David will have more to say about this. There are ways of doing dashed lines. You know, there, there are a whole host of ways of, of doing that, um, which again, you know, is not something we were able to fully accomplish in um, these different phases, but, but that's, the, that's the goal. Because I think it's, it's good for everyone to know that these this is not certain or precise and that opinions change um, and even things we think we know turn out to be um, subject to revision, which I think is a great thing to share to users. And one last question, which I think will, will segue nicely into, into David. Um, other ways, either right now or that you could envisage in connecting 
these projects to other databases like digitized inventories or, or, or archives or other museum collection pages that you know we can truly pull all of this information together yeah i that that absolutely would be the goal um right and i think what david's doing at the getty is um precisely about kind of finding efficiencies for connecting these different pods of data right that have been really quite isolated that very easily could be shared among all of these different platforms in a variety of ways. But that's that's far beyond my expertise. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Jody. That was that was great. Um, it seems a very hopefully natural segue to David. If you would like to pick up the baton, and uh... sure. Um, let me get this up. <clears throat> the Hi everybody, I'm David Newbery. I'm the enterprise software architect at the Getty Trust. Um, if Jody is an outsider as an art historian, I'm definitely an outsider as a software developer and as a, a once a time filmmaker. Um, but what I'm really interested in here is this concept of how do you, how do you do what people are asking for what Jody wants? How, or how do you structure this information so that it is usable by computers, not just by people? And a lot of my interest came here from a project at the Carnegie Museum of Art called Art Tracks. And the little picture you're seeing on the right here is what the curator came to me with and said, I would love for this thing to not be me with a ballpoint pen figuring out where our Van Gogh was in its life. I can you make a computer do this? And at this point, I, was a, I knew a lot about data visualization. I knew a lot about mapping. I was like, I can do maps, I can do timelines, I can do data visualization, this is easy. Um, sure, give me three months, I'll figure it out. And that was in 2013. Um, it turns out that the hard part is not maps and the hard part is not data visualization, the hard part is understanding what provenance actually is. Um, and so a lot of the work that I've been doing is, if we're going to think about provenance, what are we actually describing in a provenance record? And if we think about it, as using my favorite example um, of America Sat, if we think about artwork as data, we're describing a person, we're describing an owner, we're describing an artist, that's your really basic tombstone data about a painting. But when we start talking about provenance, we have to start thinking about it more, more complicatedly. And people are really, really brilliant. People are really good at understanding texts like this. If you're an art historian, if you're a curator, if you're a registrar, you know what these words all mean. Because, and it's sort of recorded as a document. And so if I give you this, it's a, there's a piece of text that is a provenance. What it really is, is a description of the histories of transfer of owner and custody of artwork across time. And so when we start thinking about provenance, we have to think about these two things at the same time. Because um, we can never get to the point where all of the context that you could write down in text, all of the context that you can understand by inference, by human experience is recorded. So can we think about it as two different chunks of data that we have to both keep around, but you can't make maps and timelines out of text. You have to do it out of data, out of spreadsheets like Joe was talking about, or more complicated data structures. Um, and then you get into this thing where if you want to talk about more complicated provenance, what starts mattering are the places and the people and the documentation that you see in it. And we need to be able to go out and link out to these things. Because as uh, Nancy was showing, often a you have a name of a person, but there's that person has four or five different names. One of our favorite stories was uh, one of our Mary Cassatt's she gave to her niece and it, we didn't realize this for a long time, or I didn't realize this, um, because that person was recorded using their married name. And so we had to actually connect the fact that this name of, you know, Horace Binney Hare was actually a cassat. But if you can link to a record that talks about who that person is, some sort of authority that can give us. Location's the same thing. We don't, provenance, it's, it's too complicated to describe every piece of detail about geography. But if we can leverage a bunch of the work that, say, the Getty's been doing, or Genomes has been doing, or many of the other gazetteer projects, Palagios, that talks about, that understands that, that helps us. Because we can't do everything ourselves. It's the, what is the information that's essential for provenance, and what parts of it can we use other people's expertise to help leverage? 
And then we get into the part where we're actually not just thinking about provenance as a piece of text with links to people, but actually breaking it down and understanding each of the different events as an activity. And this is a lot of the work that the Getty's been doing and that other people have been doing across the field, where we start thinking about each one of the transactions, the points where art changes hands from person to person, as an event that has information about it. Because if we can record these events not as a block of text, but as discrete things that happen in the life of the object, we can start pulling out what we need to do the sort of maps that Jody was talking about, to do the sort of visualizations. And when you get to that point and you start thinking about each of these events, there's huge amounts of information that we can talk about here. Um, one of the things we've learned is it's really important to keep footnotes and things like that around because you need a place to put context that can't be described. Um, the data models keep getting more and more complicated and we can't model every possible weird thing that's ever happened with artwork. So having a place to say, here's where the weird stuff goes and we're gonna write it down in words and you're gonna need a person to interpret it. Because it's, you know, modeling the entire world as a giant data structure is the sort of thing that makes computer science really happy and nobody in the world can actually use it. So there's this constant balance in what we're doing to say, what do we need to enable new ways to understand provenance? But what is too hard and too complicated so that it's, you know, technically it is possible, but it's not useful. And usefulness is really, really important here. Um, and one of the other things that's really important here is that we start realizing that a lot of these events, these transactions are referencing events that there's documentation for about in the world, auctions, catalogs, inventories. And so that, that points really nicely into the work that we're doing here at the Getty with the provenance index, which has been one of these sources of information for provenance. And taking credit for a lot of really, really smart people's work here, um, they've been doing the work here and I'm sitting back and watching and trying to uh, coordinate some of it. The, the provenance index has been taking the, same, the source documents and trying to describe them using the same sorts of techniques. To talk about these acquisitions that they have, it's not object-centered documentation the same way, it's document-centered provenance. And so rather than saying, here we're going to track the history of this Titian, or we're going to track the history of this Rembrandt, we're going to say, here is an event. Let's describe all the objects that came into here. So if you think about each object's provenance as a stream that describes that object over space and time, you can think of these as pools, as sort of places where lots and lots of information comes together and is joined together for context. And these data models that we're showing are really helpful for computer scientists, for semantic engineers, for people like me. What we've realized is that we have to just explain what we're doing in a way that um, art historians can work. And so my colleague Rob Sanderson has been writing up a bunch of this data modeling that we've all been working on at a project called Linked Art at linkedart.com, or not at just link.art on the web, that talks about these data models but tries to describe it in a way that makes it useful for other people. Um, it's a work in progress, and we're working on trying to say how can we do this work as part of a community not as a, here's the way that the Getty is doing it, but here's the way that a bunch of different people are doing it, getting the best ideas from lots of people so that we can start standardizing some of the work um, so that we can enable the reuse that you guys were asking about. As we've done this, we've learned a lot of things. And one of the things we've learned is that data management, recording this information is one of the hardest problems. Um, and in the Art Tracks project, we worked on a project called ELIZA to help people write provenances. Um, the Getty Provenance Index is working with a tool called Arches to do the same sorts of data management. Um, but that how do you record this structured data? And how do you make it so that the people with the expertise can actually um, do the data entry? Because you don't want me doing provenance research and you don't want me describing it. You want me to be there to help facilitate the experts to actually do that work. I've also learned that there's a real a lot of these really complicated data modeling questions because provenance isn't clean data like computer scientists want. Understanding the messiness and complexities of dates in art history. Understanding what acquisition models are and uh, what are the different methods that art changes hand? How do we describe it in a way that we can use that information for future things? Um, understanding how we document our sources. So many of our sources are in private repositories or, um, or in letters or in archives or aren't digitized. 
and understanding certainty. How do we say when something is uncertain? And you know, what's the difference between possibly and probably? And how do we get art historians to recognize that there's a difference and to agree on that? And is that actually something that we can do? And what we've really learned are the hard parts are that the financial and legal concepts that underlie the art market are really, really complicated. It's not this lovely, you know, you had an artwork and you gave it to me or you sold it to me. As soon as we start actually looking at real data or the inventory work that the Getty Provenance Index has been doing, we realize you have these two dealers and they buy it in shares and then one of them sells their shares to somebody else. And the legal concepts that underlie this are much more complicated than we anticipated. And it becomes this question of, do we actually need this sort of information? And if we do, how do we represent it in a way that makes sense for people? And what this gets to us is, as we start understanding more and more of the complication of the work we're doing, we run into the problem of information overload. It's the, we know so much about any one painting that figuring out how to explain that to somebody and explain it in a way that makes it useful um, for visitors, as Nancy was showing, or for researchers or for art historians to sort of provide levels of context for this information and ways to navigate through this information. And I mean, this is one of the benefits of data models is that we can start doing things like date searches. We can start doing things like geographic searches. We can start asking the important questions like we've heard about in the previous seminars, the what was in Europe during World War II. That turns out to be a really hard question because you have to know when was World War II? You know, what was a sale? What was a transaction? What was a gift? What are problematic? What names are on those watch lists? Um, and you have to know things like Delft was part of Europe in that period of time. You know, there's no word that Delft, connecting Delft to Europe is really easy if you're a human who's gone to geography class. But teaching a computer to do that search gets really, really complicated. And so we're working on this, we did at the Carnegie, we tried to learn how to do this by recording the provinces of a whole bunch of Northbrook paintings, as much as we could find about their catalog and trying to figure out how we could use that information to help people understand one collection. The provenance index, which is under work right now, is trying to figure out how you do that for a much larger data set but the inventories that they've digitized. And so that's the work that we've been doing. Um, and those are sort of the problems that we're trying to solve, which is how do we take this research that all of you are doing and record it in a way that lets us use that information to help computers help us understand that information uh, more effectively. And so that's some of the work that I've been working on. It's not the nitty gritty provenance research that so many of you are working on, but it's the underlying technology that lets us record that information and use it for future things. Thank you, David, that, that was great. Um, we're up just over halfway. Again, I would encourage all of you out there, uh, please uh, submit your questions. Um, as I sort of watch your presentation, David, and in many ways you're sort of turning provenance research almost inside out and kind of in, in, in passing it in such a way. And as you see people undertaking this work, other ways that we can do it that, are, that should be different to kind of fit this model or how do you, how? I think having watched the provenance work researchers that I've worked with, 95% of the work of provenance researchers stay, is exactly the same because the computer can't read the, the inventories. The computer can't go through the archives. The computer can't look at the back of the painting. Um, where we get the work that I'm doing is once you have that information, what's the most effective way to write it down so that it's useful for humans who want to read it again but also useful for computers to, do, to enable us to search and discover records. Um, if we only ever wanted to look at one painting at a time, you don't need the sort of complexity that I'm talking about. It becomes a question when you want to ask questions about collections in aggregate. If you wanna say what work was available from this collection in 1940s New York. Um, if all you have are the provenance texts, you have to read every single text and understand each one of them. To do that. Our hope is to say, how can we use a computer to do that hard work of collating them for you so that you can start asking more complicated questions? And I think there was a, a question that came in sort of early, early on in your talk about 
essentially asking for the, the, the benefit of data models over the present narrative method, which I think um, you've, you've, you've argued for. I mean, in, sort of in a nutshell to, I suppose, to those who are still sort of wrapping their heads around it, how would, I mean, to um, advocate for these approaches, what would be your, your sort of key, key points? I think, go, I'm sorry, go ahead. I think that it is the finding standard ways to record this information is really, really important. Um, and part of that is agreeing on shared terms. Part of that is realizing that if a computer is going to read this, you have to, you have to be more precise and you have to be more specific than you had been previously. Um, and so some of the work that came out of art tracks was a proposed update to the AAM guidelines for recording provenance. It's a, if you're going to record provenance in that standard text format, here's a little bit more formality in that description such that we can make it easier for a computer to understand. And the work that the Getty is working on right now is if you want to record that information within a computer system, here's a standard data model for within a computer system for writing down that information so the computers can reuse it. But it's work on both sides. It's saying, for people, how do you record it? For computers, how do you record it? Such that as we get better and better at doing this, we don't want people to have to go back and do huge amounts of rework, rewriting provenances. Um, but as all of you know, the hard work of provenance is not the writing down the paragraph. The hard work is all of the research that goes into knowing what to write. One, uh, actually in the interest of time, let's, let's go uh, to Christine. Um, thank you, David, for, the, for that. And again, I hope uh, we will have time to, to come back to many of these broader issues that many of the, the, these presentations are linking together. Um, Christine, can I hand over, Christine, to, to you? Yes, hello. Good evening from Berlin to everyone. I'm inviting you to, to a journey to Germany now because, and, and to, to, to do a little shift in the conversation, what I will do is introduce you into the German landscape of, of provenance research and our current challenges here in Germany and, and where, where it will go um, or where the future will lead us here in Germany, which hopefully will help or provide you useful information. Um, let's start with the German landscape and I will just switch into my presentation. Okay, at latest since the Gullet case, um, I hope you all know what I'm talking about, the Munich um, art discovery in 2012, we see a strong political and public interest in provenance research in Germany and experience a high pressure in researching the provenance of our public collections. This led to the foundation of a supporting institution um, for museums in 2008, which is since 2015, the German Lost Art Foundation in Magdeburg, not in Berlin, in Magdeburg, a small city, like one and a half hours away from Berlin. Um, this foundation is not only the financial supporter of provenance research in our museum, so if you want to research your collection, do a first check up, um, you can ask for money, for funding, and in, in most cases you will get it. And for a year you can hire someone, a provenance researcher, to do the first checkup or, or to go into a deeper research um, of a special focus of your collection. The foundation, the, lost, the German Lost Art Foundation, also maintains um, the Lost Art website that you may all know, a website that um, is run in, in German, but also in English and in Russia, Russian. It contains data on cultural assets that were relocated and seized from their owners during World War II with a lost and found section. The German version of this website provides much more context um, than the English and the Russian one, um, which is a module on provenance research, what you can see here on the screenshot. Um, where you find amongst others under the topic Nazi persecuted persecution related looted art, a list of people like dealers, agents, transport companies, etc., that were engaged in the Nazi loot. In general, prominence research in Germany has become a professional 
field of its own in the last 15 to 20 years, so since the Washington Principles. German provenance researchers are very well networked with each other. Jane and Laurie already mentioned it in the first session of this webinar, um, the Arbeitskreis Provenienzforschung, e.V. This is a networking group, our networking group, um, with more than 250 members, not only in Germany, but also in France, Switzerland, Austria, and, and also the States. And this Arbeitskreis has, since this year before it were biannual, now annual meetings where we exchange um, research fundings, current research projects, experiences, and also future, um, future collaborations or whatever what will come up. And also a digital platform to exchange um, questions, findings. Um, and this portal, it's, it's called the DZK portal. Um, it's also run by the, the Lost Art Foundation. It's really helpful if you want to, to exchange with, with colleagues. And I, I strongly encourage you to, to become a member because that's if you deal with artworks that formerly might have been in Germany, which I, I think in, in many cases um, will be like this or will be the case, um, this, this up, the Arbeitskreis in general, but also then the, the possibilities of exchange are very, very useful. What are our challenges today? Um, in Germany, provenance research focuses on three eras. This is the Nazi era, then the time of the Soviet occupation zone and the German Democratic Republic, and now also very recently, or now very strong and in, in also the public discussion, um, the colonial time. These fields include a variety of historical and geographical contexts and an enormous quantity of objects, just to give you an idea you, you all deal with, with enormous quantity of objects, but just from the German perspective here in Berlin, the Ethnological Museum um, has a collection of North and East Asian art. And this collection contains more than 45,000 objects. The Museum for Asian Art that I'm working with, um, the East Asian collection contains more than 25,000 objects. Regarding this quantity and the on enormous task, um, we know that we have to be more effective in what we are doing and what we have and that we have to put provenance research on a next level. So far in Germany, provenance researchers often generate, they generate knowledge for themselves, for their institution, um, but they accept the when 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 we meet and discuss things, um, we don't we don't have platforms or, or data general databases where we can share our knowledge. Um, so a general platform that we can nourish with, nourish with all our, our knowledge, which of course um, leads to a duplication of research in, in many, many cases. And this is one of the big challenges we are facing here in Germany, that we, we need to establish a sustainable knowledge management. And also um, regarding the, 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 the wide, what I just described, this wide variety of, of historical context and geographical context, we, we, we have to work on, on a basic or extend our basic research on art market structures, on actors, on collecting patterns in, in all three era, areas or eras. Um, for example, here at the Technische Universität where I'm working, we have a project on the French art market um, under German occupation, where we collect data on actors, on places, networks, sources, um, during these four to five years of German occupation. Um, and this all will be fed into a, a database um, accessible to everyone. This is just one small example for such a project, and we need more of, of these. Of course, all this development goes hand in hand with the need to enlarge our international networks. And uh, we already heard of the of PREP, of the Provenance Research Exchange Program, which is a great opportunity for German and, and American provenance research curators to, to meet and to exchange. But now that we have to deal, for example, with, with objects or more and more um, to research objects coming from Africa, from East Asia, 
um, or many other parts of the world, um, we need more specific networks. And that's what, what we are also doing now. Um, we here at the, at the Technische Universität, we together with the Museum for Asian Art, we created a network um, for so far German speaking researchers or, or colleagues um, researching the provenance of East Asian objects. Um, and that's a, it's a great community so far. We are we're now trying to, to meet every year and to exchange our, our research or to talk about our problems and, and of course to inspire each other to exchange um, sources that we found, et cetera, et cetera. On many occasions, um, the last one I have in mind was the annual meeting of the Arbeitskreis last fall in Vienna. Um, it has been clearly expressed that all these tasks um, that I just mentioned cannot be taken over by museums, but um, that it's a task for, for academic institutions. So what basic research um, to foster international corporations, um, international networks, also, what I forgot to say, to train a new generation of provenance researchers, because what we face here in Germany is that there are more and more provenance research, uh, projects um, coming up. And it's, Germany sees it as a, as a, as a, as a national task to, to research the collections. And we need, of course, people who can work in the projects. Um, and this is obviously a task that not a single museum can take over. We need institutions for that. Um, this demand that it might be the, the universities who can do so um, meets the current academic development in Germany. In the last year, we, there were five professorships um, that have been created at three universities in Germany. Jane already mentioned that in, in session one of the webinar series in Hamburg, in Bonn, and in Munich. And currently, the Technische Universität, my university, is looking for a junior professor for digital provenance, which will be, I think, the first one of its kind, um, to, to work on, on issues that David, Jody, just, just mentioned, um, which at the moment in Germany, we don't really have someone working on that. Um, and this is also something that, that in the future, Germany has to become stronger and also to maybe relate projects here to projects um, in the States, for example, or at other places in the world. Yeah, I think that was the general overview. And I'm happy to answer questions if there are. Uh, thank you, Christine. Um, we have uh, we are in our, our last ten minutes or so, so we, we do have uh, time for questions. One question for you, Christine, if I may. Um, you'd mentioned sort of this desire that um, universities take on some of this work rather than museums. Is there, if I'm not simplifying, is the a museum happy about that situation in Germany, or is it is there a is that still a discussion to have? That's a very good question. Um, I think in general, curators are very happy. What I was always asked, they are happy um, that there are more and more institutions to deliver basic research because that's a big, big problem. I was always asked, isn't there a handbook on, on the dealers for East Asian art in Germany or in Europe? We don't have such, so just an example from my work. Um, so I know from the curators that they are very happy about it. Um, I think it works as long as the institutions are working together. Of course, the universities can't do it without um, interacting with the museums. So, um, and that's what we are trying to do here at the Technische University, that we have many collaborations with museums um, and that this exchange is, is like fluent. Um, but I think the creators in general, on, on, on that level, they are very happy. And also for the offer, we, for example, here we have, we, we founded a center for art market studies in 2012. We have a lecture series and there, 
many, many colleagues coming every time. So um, there we can just feel the need for such lectures for feeding them with that and giving them also a platform to, to, to um, present their findings. This is sort of, I think, feeds into that and builds on a number of the discussions we've had today. Um, it's all about interoperability. Christine, you mentioned sustainable knowledge management. David, you touched upon the need for data standards. And what's the balance between producing question or visualization driven data versus data that can be used by lots of people in different ways? Or is it is that a or is there is there a sort of one size fits all approach or or I suppose do we risk having still lots of little different projects and how can we kind of break through that? I think that the if we look I think that one of the reasons why standards are so important and one of the reasons why it's so amazing to see all the different projects being done in Provenance right now is because um, we need that sort of model for understanding what provenance is that can answer many of the questions. If you build your data model to solve a particular problem, be it a map or be it a, a website or be it a collection page or be it a single art, a art history research project, your data, you only get the data that you need for that. And so much of what we need is what is the fundamental data that you need to, to solve problems? And, and you know, the flip side of that is what is so complicated that you can't do that sustainability part of it. And this is the, the hard problem that we're all trying to solve is where is that, you know, the more complete and the more complex your data model is, the more kinds of questions it can answer and the more work it is for the people doing data entry to fill that level of nuance out. So I don't know that anyone has found the right answer of where that middle ground is, but that's one of the big questions that we keep asking. Uh, um, I suppose that feeds in, and I suppose this is maybe a, a question for those of us in within museums. The the databases that we use, TMS and others, do I mean? Do they, in some ways, you know, how can we use those most effectively? Do they, you know, are we are, are we I suppose limiting ourselves with the? Um, you know, the way that we put information in is all, itself already shaped, and so you know, do we need to think about other other approaches simply to uh, documenting the research that we do? And I think that's going to be the big question of the next couple of years: is <clears throat> as we want our data to do more than just document objects, do we need to change the tools we use to record that data? Um, and if this requires new tools, how are those tools supported and sustained? Um, one of the things we learned on Artrax is building the tool is possible, but building a community or an organization that can sustain that tool over time is really, really hard. Um, it's that need for ongoing funding and resources, not for in the not in the timeline of a grant, but in the timeline of museum practice. I mean, TMS knows how to do that. I don't know that the Carnegie said that they didn't know how to do that. Um, and it's an open question what the Getty can do. And so it is that how do you, and if we all build separate tools, it's almost certainly going to be unsustainable. So we're in, we're in our, our last minute. Um, so maybe just as a, as a final wrap up to, to all four of you, it's, one sort of happy coincidence of this webinar is it's 20 years since the Washington Principles. Um, I'm not going to ask where you predict we're going to be in another 20 years, but from all of your separate perspectives, where would you where do you think the field should be should be aiming at over the next 20 years? I start. <laughs> For me, is it to have a more a, a, a broader understanding of art mar of the art market and art market structures in all these specific geographic areas and and contexts. So, in my case, East Asian art, I would love to understand or to know what are the dealers, 
what were the dealers, uh, where did they work, how, did, how were they networked, to have a, not complete, of course, that's not, that's not possible, but to a good understanding of that. And also the, the, what is now a big challenge is to understand um, what happened in the countries of origin in, in China, Japan, who the actors there. And then also, of course, to have, to have an understanding of what is in our collections, because <laughs> if it comes to East Asian art, often we don't know what we have there, where it comes from, um, which ways did it go. So just to have a broader idea of that. I, I don't think that we will know it for all these objects. It's just too huge, the collections, but um, yeah, that would be my goal. <laughs> I, would, I would agree. I think that in 20 years, it will be the less provenance will be less about documenting the history of an object and more about that object as a primary source and that the history of that object is a primary source for these larger networks of interconnected information. And for my part, I would just say that uh, I would like to see, besides this interconnectedness, um, greater sharing between colleagues, uh, between institutions, and with the public, because that's also another source of information that we can tap into. Um, so greater connectivity overall with all of our audience members. And I don't think I could put it any better than my fellow panelists. I think that really summarizes where everything would be heading in a, everything's an ideal world. That seems like a, a very good point, good, good note to end. Thank you to, to all four of you for, for contributing. Thank you to all of you watching and for submitting your questions. I'm sorry we didn't have time for everything, uh, but as I say, we are, we are delighted to see such interest and we hope that this provides the starting point for further conversations. Thank you very much. <laughs>